Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today we will be talking about a stock that was suggested by a subscriber. That stock is Visa. Visa is one of the world's largest electronic retail payment network. Today we will be reviewing the company's 10K annual report to get a better idea of its business model. Then we'll review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. We'll look at the company's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis to find the intrinsic value of the company and finally perform an expected rate of return calculation to see if we were to invest in Visa at the current stock price, what kind of return can we expect on this investment? So let's dive in and review Visa. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 10K, which is the annual report that Visa filed with the SEC. This is for the fiscal year that ended September 30th, 2020. In item one of the report is about the business, where Visa gives us a business overview. Visa states that it is one of the world's leaders in digital payments. It facilitates digital payments across more than 200 countries and territories among a global set of customers, merchants, financial institutions, businesses, strategic partners, and government entities through innovative technologies. Visa then gives us an idea of some of the products and services that it offers. It states that it facilitates transactions between financial institutions, merchants, and consumers. It offers a wide range of Visa-branded payment products. Visa takes an open partnership approach where it innovates and expands the payment ecosystem. Visa is accelerating the migration to digital payment. It provides value-added services and it invests in and promotes its brands. Next, on page 7 of the report, Visa gives us an idea about its revenue. It states that it has one reportable segment, which is its payment segment. Visa shows have its service revenue, which includes services provided in support of client usage of Visa products, brought in about $9.8 billion. It's data processing revenues, which includes revenue earned on authorization, clearing, settlement, value-added services, network access, and other maintenance and support services brought in about $11 billion. It's international transaction revenues, which accounts for cross-border transaction processing and currency conversion activities brought in about $6.3 billion, and other revenues brought in about $1.4 billion. In total, the gross revenue brought in was about $28.5 billion. And after subtracting its client incentive of about $6.7 billion, Visa's net revenue for the year 2020 came to about $21.8 billion. On the next page, Visa clarifies that it is not a financial institution, it does not issue any cards, it does not earn revenue from or bear credit risk with respect to interest or fees paid by account holders on Visa products. In short, Visa is that middleman that ensures that when you swipe your card, there's a seamless transition of money from you and your financial institution to that of the merchant and its financial institution. Next, on page 18 of the report, Visa compares its network to that of its competitors. We can see that on all these metrics of payment volume, total volume, total transactions, and cards, Visa surpasses all its competitors. Now that we have a good idea of Visa's business overview and its revenue breakdown, let's focus on the company's fundamentals by reviewing its key ratios. Hey guys, now let's look at Visa's key ratios. I'm on Morningstar looking at Visa under key ratios. We have the financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company makes from its sales. Back in 2011, Visa's revenue was about $9.2 billion. And for the year 2020, it was about $21.8 billion. Over the past 10 years, Visa's revenue has been trending upwards. Next is the operating income. The operating income is the amount of money that's left with the company once it has paid for the cost of goods and operating expenses. Back in 2011, Visa's operating income was about $5.5 billion. And for the year 2020, it was about $14 billion. Visa's operating income follows a similar trend as its revenue. In other words, Visa's operating income has been trending upwards. After that, looking at the net income, the net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it has paid for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes. Back in 2011, Visa's net income was about $3.7 billion. And for the year 2020, it was about $10.9 billion. We can see that over the past 10 years, Visa has always reported a net profit, and its net profit has been trending upwards. Next, looking at the dividends per share. Back in 2011, Visa paid out about $0.15 cent per share as dividend, and for the chilling 12 months, it paid out about $1.22 per share as dividend. When we look at the past 10-year trend, we can see that Visa has hiked its dividend every year for the past 10 years. Next, looking at the payout ratio. The payout ratio is the ratio of the company's dividend to its income, so it gives us an idea of how much of the company's income is actually being paid out as dividend. Back in 2011, Visa's payout ratio was about 11.6%, and for the year 2020, it was about 21.8%. What this means is 21.8% of Visa's 2020 income was being paid out as dividend. After that, looking at shares outstanding, back in 2011, Visa had 2,828 million shares outstanding. 
And for the trailing 12 months, it has 2,213 million shares outstanding. Over the past 10 years, Visa shares outstanding numbers have been decreasing. That is good news for existing shareholders, as when a company buys back its shares, it's actually increasing the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. Next, looking at the book value per share. The book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. Back in 2011, Visa's book value per share was about $10 per share. And for the trailing 12 months, it's about $16 per share. Over the past 10 years, Visa's book value has always been positive, which tells us that the company always had more assets than its liabilities on its balance sheet. Finally, looking at the free cash flow. The free cash flow is what we get when we subtract capital spending from the company's operating cash flow. Back in 2011, Visa's free cash flow was about $3,519 million. And for the year 2020, it was about $9,704 million. I will be using the past 10 years of free cash flows from my expected rate of return calculation. And I will be using the 2020 figure of $9,704 million for my discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. When we compare the 2019 numbers to those of 2020, we can see that the revenue, operating income, net income, as well as free cash flow saw a decline in the year 2020. This was primarily because of the pandemic. And as people use less credit cards, the company made less money through its transactions, which meant it recorded a lowered revenue number, which trickled down to its net income number being lower. And hence, we see a lower numbers in the year 2020 than in 2019. Now, let's look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line. So it compares the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2011, the company's net margin was about 39.73%. And for the year 2020, it was about 50%. What this means is every $100 that the company made in the year 2020, by the time it paid for its cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes, it had about $49.73 left as pure profit. Next, looking at the return on equity. The return on equity is the ratio of the company's net income to its shareholders' equity. Warren Buffett prefers to only invest in securities who had a return on equity of 8% or greater every year for the past 10 years. Back in 2011, Visa's return on equity was about 14.19%, and for the year 2020, it was about 36%. Over the past 10 years, except in the year 2012, Visa's return on equity has been greater than 8%. More importantly, ever since 2013, Visa's return on equity has been greater than 15%, which tells us that the company has a moat. In other words, Visa is providing a service which has a competitive advantage over its competitors. Next, looking at the return on invested capital. The return on invested capital gives us an idea of how good the management is at allocating the company's capital and getting a return on that investment. Back in 2011, Visa's return on invested capital was about 14.27%, and for the year 2020, it was about 21.65%. Visa's weighted average cost of capital, also known as the company's hurdle rate, is about 7.3%. And we can see that in the year 2020, the company's management created a return of about 21.65% on the invested capital. And since the company's return on invested capital is greater than its weighted average cost of capital, we can confidently say that the company's management is creating value for its shareholders. Finally, looking at the interest coverage, the interest coverage gives us an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest obligations using its income in that calendar year. Benjamin Graham preferred to only invest in securities who had an interest coverage of five times or greater. For the year 2020, Visa's interest coverage was about 27.72 times. What this means is Visa can pay off its interest obligations 27.72 times using its 2020 income. Now let's look at the company's financial health, focusing on the company's liquidity ratios. The first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want to invest in companies who have a current ratio of 1.5 or greater. Back in 2011, Visa's current ratio was about 2.66, and for the latest quarter, it's at 2.12. Next is the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the company's current ratio, except we disregard the inventory. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Ideally, we want the company's quick ratio to be at least greater than 1 as that indicates that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to meet its current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's quick ratio was about 1.27, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.73. Next, looking at the financial leverage. The financial leverage compares the company's total assets to its shareholders' equity. A higher financial leverage number tells us that more of the company's assets are financed through its liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's financial leverage was about 1.31, And for the latest quarter, it's at 2.37. Over the past 10 years, Visa's financial leverage has slowly been increasing. Finally, looking at the debt-to-equity ratio, 
This ratio compares the company's total debt to its shareholders' equity. Ideally, we want the company's debt to equity ratio to be less than 1.0. Back in 2016, Visa's debt to equity ratio was at 0.58, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.62. All these financial health and liquidity ratios that Visa has are better than its competitors, such as MasterCard, Discover, and American Express. Now let's look at the efficiency ratios. The first item on the list is the day sales outstanding. This number gives us an idea of how many days go by from the day company recognizes its sales to the day it actually receives cash for its service rendered. Back in 2011, Visa's day sales outstanding number was at 20.58 days. For the year 2020, it's about 26.40 days. We can see that from 2011 through 2019, the company's day sales outstanding was in the low 20s, and then it saw a jump in the year 2020. A jump in the day sales outstanding number tells us that for that year, the company was aggressive in its accounting. In other words, it was being aggressive with recognizing its revenue quicker so that it can report an inflated income number on its income statement. Next, looking at the payables period, this number gives us an idea of how many days does the company take to pay its suppliers. Back in 2011, Visa's payables period was about 30.75 days, and for the year 2020, it was about 13.35 days. Over the past 10 years, the company's payables period have been decreasing, which tells us that Visa is getting better at paying its suppliers. Finally, looking at the receivables turnover, this number gives us an idea of how many times does Visa collect its receivables from its customers in a calendar year. Back in 2011, the receivables turnover was about 17.74 times, and for the year 2020, it was about 13.83 times. Ideally, we want to see the company's receivable turnover to be staying steady or increasing. However, we do see a drop in the year 2020, which is likely due to the pandemic. Now let's compare the company's current valuation to that of the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. Visa's price to earnings is at 47.4, whereas S&P 500 is at 28.9. Visa's price to book is at 14.5, whereas S&P 500 is at 4.1. Visa's price to sales is at 23.7, whereas S&P 500 is at 3.0. Visa's price to cash flow is at 50.5, whereas S&P 500 is at 17.1. And finally, the dividend yield. Visa's dividend yield is at 0.5%, whereas S&P 500's yield is at 1.6%. We can see that on all these valuation metrics, Visa is overvalued when compared to the S&P 500. Hey guys, now let's look at Visa's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Over here, I pasted Visa's 2020 free cash flow, which was $9,704 million. I'm using an annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 10%. What this means is I expect Visa's free cash flow to grow at 10% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. What this means is I expect to get a 10% return on this investment. I'm using a long-term growth rate of 5%. What this means is after the 10-year mark into perpetuity, I expect Visa's free cash flow to grow at 5%. Visa has 2,213 million shares outstanding and has long-term debt of $21,071 million. I got this number from Visa's balance sheet. After taking into account all these inputs, we get the intrinsic value per share to be about $126.41 per share. When we compare this intrinsic value to the current stock price of about $230 per share, we can see that the current stock is trading about 82% above the company's intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows, which come out to about $97 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10-year mark into perpetuity. We sum all those up, which come out to about $300 billion. From this number, we subtract the long-term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $126. Now, if we disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if we think that Visa is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $34 per share. And if we disregard both the debt and the perpetuity, then we get the intrinsic value without the debt and perpetuity to be about $44 per share. Finally, if we drop the company's discount rate to 8%, which is right in line with the company's weighted average cost of capital, also known as the company's hurdle rate, then we get the intrinsic value using of 8% discount rate to be about $227 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to the current stock price, we can see that the company is neither overvalued nor undervalued at the current stock price. Hey guys, now let's look at the expected rate of return calculation for Visa. Over here, I pasted the past 10 years of free cash flows that I got from Morningstar. All the numbers here are in millions of US dollars. This is the early free cash flow trend that we get over the past 10 years. The free cash flows have been trending upwards. Next, looking at the future data and predictions, I'm assuming that there's a 40% likelihood that Visa's free cash flow will grow at 12%. 
there's a 45% likelihood that its free cash flow will grow at 8%, and a 15% likelihood that its free cash flow will grow at 4%. These are the potential free cash flow rates that we get into the future. After taking into account the numbers of shares outstanding, which is at 2,213 million shares, at the current stock price of about $230 per share, we can expect to get a return of about 1.4%. What this means is if you were to purchase a share of Visa at the current stock price of about $230 per share and hold this security through 2075, then we can expect to get an annual return of about 1.4% on this investment. Hey guys, now let's wrap it all up. We reviewed Visa's 10K annual report to get a better idea of its business model. We saw how Visa acts as a middleman who helps facilitate the transactions between the consumer and the merchant and their financial institutions. We also saw that Visa's revenue, operating income, as well as net income have been increasing over the past 10 years. The company's shares outstanding have been decreasing, which tells us that the company has been buying back its shares, and the company has been hiking its dividend every year for the past 10 years. The company's buyback policy and its dividend policy is shareholder friendly. Visa has a high profit margin, which tells us that most of the company's revenue actually becomes profit by the time it's done paying for its expenses. Visa's return on equity has been greater than 15% for most of the past 10 years, which tells us that the company has a moat. In other words, it has a competitive advantage. Visa's current and quick ratio both tell us that the company has more than enough current assets to fulfill its current liabilities. In other words, it has enough oxygen in its system to survive for another 12 months. Visa's financial leverage has been increasing every year for the past 10 years, which tells us that more and more of the company's assets are actually financed through liabilities rather than its shareholder equity. On all the four metrics, that is its current ratio, quick ratio, financial leverage, and debt to equity ratio, Visa is better than its competitors such as MasterCard, Discover, and American Express. We noticed that Visa had a unique year in 2020, but if we disregard that year, Visa has been consistent with its efficiency over the past 10 years. When we compared Visa to the S&P 500, we found that on all the valuation metrics, Visa was overvalued to the S&P 500. Next, when we performed the discounted free cash flow DCF analysis, we found that if we used a 10% discount rate, the intrinsic value came out to about $126 per share. And when we used an 8% discount rate, the intrinsic value was about $227 per share. This means that at the 8% discount rate, the company is neither under nor overvalued. After that, we looked at the company's expected rate of return calculation and found out that if you were to invest in Visa at the current stock price of about $230 per share, we can expect to get an annual return of about 1.4% on this investment. We noticed that Visa's transaction volumes were depressed in the year 2020 due to the pandemic. However, once the economy reopens and as people start spending more, the company is likely to see a growth in its revenue. Overall, although Visa is overvalued and there is a chance that blockchain technology may replace the role that Visa plays in the electronic transaction ecosystem, Visa fundamentally is a solid company and appears to be a good long-term investment. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on Visa interesting. If you like the content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions as to which stock I should review next, please leave it in the comment section below. I will greatly appreciate it. Thank you.